What happens when a group of scientists makes some prediction of impending disaster? Keep doing such and such, they say, and the following catastrophe will result. This is the story of Cassandra, Princess of Troy. Of the five largest wildfires in the history of California, four occurred simultaneously in the summer of 2020. And in the midst of this crisis, Donald Trump was on Fox News blaming a fish. I mean, we could create an area which is almost impossible for it to catch fire. You know, in California, they have tremendous amounts of water pouring down from the north. Tremendous. You look at it, and yet they have, they have no water. And all they have to do is let the water come down. You know what they do with the water? They send it out into the Pacific Ocean. They have this massive valve up north, and as the water comes pouring down from the snow and all beautiful, nice, clean water, they send it out because there's a tiny little fish that they're trying to save that's doing very poorly, by the way. I think it's a smelt. Tiny little fish. To most people, this comment is indistinguishable from any number of nonsense statements to come out of Donald Trump's mouth. But in reality, he was tapping into a very deep well of right-wing conspiracy theorizing. Show the little delta smelt of this little minnow fish. A minnow that isn't even good enough to be bait. The delta smelt, a tiny fish. Now, I, I've heard about the delta smelt. 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 The delta smelt is a small translucent fish that likes cool, brackish waters. It's about three inches long, one ounce, and has a lifespan of about one year, living in saltier bay water during its adulthood before swimming upstream to freshwater to reproduce at the end of the year. There is nothing special about this fish, except that conservative media has convinced half the country that it's responsible for every natural disaster that has befallen California in the past decade, which is quite a feat because by the time the president was blaming wildfires on it, it had already gone extinct. I say gone extinct, more like it was driven there. We're gonna send these Delta smelt to sleep with the fishes. This is the story of the Delta smelt, the first species in history to be driven to extinction by a cable news smear campaign. They're still moving. California is essentially a giant bowl. The coast, the border with Nevada, the redwoods in the north, and the Mojave Desert to the south are all lined with mountains. So all the rainwater and snowmelt from these mountains are all collected in the same two rivers, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin. These two rivers converge in a sort of backwards delta, which empties into the San Francisco Bay. This delta is creatively named the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, and this valley in the middle of California is creatively named the Central Valley. And in California, rain falls mostly in the north end and nowhere else. If not for irrigation, most of the valley would be a desert. And most of the river water comes not from rain, but from snowmelt, which means it's seasonal. It comes not at all during the summer and winter, and then all at once in the early spring. By nature, California is either uninhabitably dry or uninhabitably wet. Farming there is a bit of a gamble. That is until FDR was elected president. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves. And suddenly a bunch of money could flow in from the federal government for public works projects. Projects like dams. This is the story of Hoover Dam one of America's seven modern civil engineering wonders. Dams meant California could capture flood water and then parcel it out to farmers during the drought season. And that water could be provided cheap to any farmer that was willing to front the money to build a canal. This scheme became known as the Central Valley Project, and it dammed virtually every major river in California. And the valley became a massive swath of farmlands. And that's just the beginning, because remember, most people don't live in the valley, they live in Los Angeles. As Los Angeles has grown, California has embarked on bigger and bigger projects to get water there. In fact, the history of California is basically the history of harebrained schemes to get Los Angeles more water. The most ambitious of these is the California Aqueduct, a massive set of pumps, canals, pipelines, and reservoirs that are capable of moving river water from basically any part of the state 
to Los Angeles. Words fail to describe how big and complex the system is. But to give you an idea, imagine a gallon of water flowing down a stream in the Scott Mountains in Northern California near the border with Oregon. It eventually joins up with the Trinity River. Now it should eventually join with the Klamath River and go out to sea right around here. But instead it's dammed up and then diverted 10 miles through a pipe buried underneath the Trinity Mountains to here, the Whiskeytown Reservoir. Eventually, it's released into the Sacramento River, where it flows 200 miles south down to the Delta, where it should, again, let out to the ocean here. But instead, it's sucked up by a massive pumping station and sent here to the Clifton Court Forebay. Then it gets pumped 70 miles south through the Delta Mendota Canal and pumped up here to the San Luis Reservoir, where it waits until it's needed, at which point it is dropped through a power turbine into the O'Neill Reservoir and then outlet again into the California Aqueduct where it is pumped another 200 miles south to a new set of pumping stations. The last of these, the Edmonston Pumping Plant, pumps the water up a half mile vertically over the Tehachapi Mountains, where it is eventually released here into the Pyramid and Castaic Lakes. And from there, it can flow down at its leisure into the Los Angeles Metropolitan Waterworks, who can then pump it to its final destination here in Kim Kardashian's swimming pool. When was the last time you used a pool? I've never used our pool, actually. What? Money well spent. And yet, most of that water doesn't go to LA, even though that's who the infrastructure was built for. Instead, most of it goes to the farms. Farms consume between 30 and 60% of the state's water. And water is not a free market commodity. It's a hierarchy. The government has a list of who has priority. That hierarchy is complicated, but to massively simplify, it goes something like this. In California water law, there are essentially five different types of customers. One, the federal government. Two, people who called dibs during the gold rush. Three, the major coastal cities. Four, the old institutional farmers that fronted the money to build the dams. Five, everyone else. If there's a shortage, instead of it being rationed out evenly between each buyer, customer one gets all of their water, then customer two, then customer three gets whatever's left, and customer four gets nothing. And there's almost always a shortage. The amount of water that's promised is based on the capacity of the reservoirs, and the reservoirs only fill up about once every 10 years. So imagine being the poor bastards who are last in line. Hello, I'm Tom Birmingham, General Manager of Westlands Water District. As the largest irrigation district in the nation, Westlands is proud to serve farmers on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. The southwest corner of the Central Valley is the worst part to farm. It's the driest corner, it has no major rivers running through it, and the soil is so toxic that when they first tried to farm it, the runoff created a pool of water so toxic that every bird in 20 miles got horrible birth defects. But in the late 50s, California decided it needed to build a reservoir around there anyway for their giant pump to Los Angeles. So while they were at it, they might as well irrigate the land nearby. And so Westlands Water District was born. Westlands Water District is, on paper, basically a public utility. They purchase the water from the government and handle the logistics of getting it to the customers. But in practice, their most important job is to act as lobbyists for their customers, fighting legal and political battles against other water districts for every last drop. So it might be instructive to compare Westlands to its main competitor, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. The Metropolitan Water District of Southern California is a massive conglomeration of all the city water utilities on the southern coast of the state. It represents almost the entire Southwest. And as you might expect, it's the most powerful and consumes the most water, about 2 million acre feet. The second biggest water district is the aforementioned Westlands, representing this little section of the Southwest corner of the valley. It consumes about a million acre feet, just about half as much as the cities. But Metropolitan Water District represents about 19 million people, and Westlands represents about 300 farming companies. You might think the 300 people consuming as much water as the city of Los Angeles would be the most powerful people in the state, but the problem is they're not. In fact, as far as water is concerned, they're some of the weakest. The cities, being the economic engine of the state, are always going to have their needs prioritized over the farmers. And because the Westlands aren't near any natural bodies of water, they have no inherited water rights. And because they're rich, they're not very sympathetic to the public. But because they aren't as rich as the giant corporate farmers just south of them, including the richest farmers in the country who managed to get their own privatized massive reservoir, which is its own wild story, they don't have the same pull with Sacramento. And because their water project was one of the last to be built, they're last in line to get water from the federal government. 
So when Westland's farmers can't get the water they need from the Central Valley Project, they'll have to buy it at exorbitant rates from their richer neighbors to the south. In other words, the farmers of Westlands are rich and powerful, it's just that they're the most dangerous type of rich. They're precariously rich, and they're surrounded by humiliating reminders that they aren't the most rich. In fact, there's really only one water user less powerful than Westlands, and that would be the fish that swim in the water. The Sacramento River is filled with anadromous fish, fish that hatch way upstream in the rivers, exit into the ocean, live their lives there a few years before swimming back upstream to lay their eggs. The most important of those fish is the salmon. If the salmon dies, most of the sports fishing and tourism upriver dies along with it, along with the businesses it supports, and the Native American communities that have treaties guaranteeing their access to salmon. It will also permanently kill the commercial salmon fishing industry south of Alaska, and it will kill the pods of orcas that live off the coast of San Francisco Bay eating those salmon, killing the whale watching industry in the city as well. And the salmon are dying. The dams prevent salmon from hitting much of their natural spawning grounds. The San Joaquin River is just completely dry in some places. The water is increasingly full of agricultural runoff, a euphemism for roundup and cow shit. And critically, the pump that gets water from the delta to the San Luis Reservoir pulls salt water deeper into the delta, changes the currents of the habitat, which confuses the fish, and has a habit of sucking the baby salmon into the pipes where they hit the fan and then... But that bass is blended just the way you like it. Wow, that's terrific bass. But the people who depend on that ecosystem, the fishing industry, the farmers inside the Delta, and the environmentalists only contribute a few hundred million to the economy, compared to the Westlands farmers three to four billion. Which means if Westlands needs to take water from someone else to survive, politically, fishermen are the easiest target. But an entire ecosystem has value beyond short-term revenue. So we have laws to protect them, like the Endangered Species Act. But getting landmark environmental legislation overturned just for a marginal increase in farm productivity is kind of a big ask. So how can a business interest get a large number of voters to get interested and take their side? Easy. Turn it into a culture war issue. A clique of environmental extremists with lots of money and no common sense have fostered the insane policies that are destroying one of the most vibrant and productive industries of California. So I know what you're asking. Wasn't this supposed to be about the smelt? Why yes, actually. Let's talk about the smelt. So while the pro-Delta interests are primarily worried about keeping the salmon alive, saving it is an uphill battle. The idea of a species going extinct only in a single river doesn't really scare people like a total species extinction. And there are other rivers with this species of salmon, so what would really be useful is a fish whose entire species is at risk. And that's where our little friend comes in. The delta smelt lives only in the delta. If the delta goes, an entire species gets wiped out in one fell swoop. So the environmentalists sued in a federal court for Endangered Species Act protections. And in 2007, they won. They got a federal injunction against pumping water from the delta during spawning season. Now the farmers are forced to fight a two-front war. One front against the state on salmon, and one against the federal government on the smelt. That might seem like a smart idea, but it actually created a huge PR opportunity for the farmers. Because there's no real human constituency at risk if the smelt goes extinct. And it's small. And it looks like any number of replaceable guppies and minnows. And the fact that it was a federal injunction also presented another opportunity. It meant you could make the issue about the president, and the 44th president of the United States has a well-known ability to make certain people go absolutely insane. The president came out addressing reporters on Thursday, and he was wearing this tan suit. And only the Democrats and only liberals could actually elect a guy with a tan suit. A serious businessman wears dark blue or black to important meetings. I think it's a sign to enemies that he's a wimp. ISIS is watching. If you were the head of ISIS, if you were Baghdadi, if you were any of the ISIS, anyone in the ISIS leadership, would you come away from yesterday afraid of the United States? So, hypothetically, if you ignored the salmon and the Delta water users, and ignored the fact that the pumping restrictions started under George Bush, and you ignored that the farmers are all millionaires, and ignored the fact that the pumping restrictions only amount to about 10% of the water they need, and that the farmers in the Westlands wouldn't even get most of it since they're last in line, you could turn this into a story of the rabid far-left eco-terrorist Obama forcing little oaky children to starve in order to save one tiny pointless fish. But who could you get to sell that story? I mean, they'd have to be a completely shameless liar to do it with a straight face. With, like, no conscience whatsoever. And 
preferably beady little shark eyes. Farmers in California, they're losing their land, their crops, and their livelihood all because of a two-inch fish. As many as 80,000 people are going to lose jobs. They're shutting off water. Welcome to the valley that hope forgot. We are live in the Central Valley in California and what has become ground zero in a battle between environmentalists and whether or not the farmers in the Central Valley here have water. Ladies and gentlemen, this has become a dust bowl. They have all this water that they're sending to the ocean rather to the farms because of the little delta smelt. But Sean's right, it's not just affecting these farmers. I'm from the East Coast. It's affecting all of you guys out there as well. If we have to start importing tomatoes from other countries like China or South America, of course prices are gonna go up for you and more jobs out here will be lost. Unemployment's already bad. So it's worth stopping here to talk about the agricultural economy of California. California is said to produce 25% of America's food. And that's true kind of. It's 25% not by calorie, but by dollar value, because California specializes in very expensive cash crops. Wine grapes in Napa Valley, marijuana in the mountains, lettuce in the central coast, rice in the northern central valley, and in the southern central valley, it's nuts. Particularly almonds. The popularity of almond milk in Asia, and especially China, has caused the price of almonds to skyrocket. And increasingly, the San Joaquin Valley puts all its water into almond trees. So despite the attempt to misleadingly use statistics to make it seem like this fight will have some dramatic effect on food prices, really all that's at stake is a bottom line for these farmers, and maybe the price of almond milk goes up 10 cents. And so, for lack of better options, Hannity and the farmers have to hide behind the farm workers. The Community Food Bank, this is what you're seeing now, where they're feeding 30,000 people every month. Do you ever shed tears over this? Is it... <laughs> every day. Every day. Why the tears? Because a lot of people need this help, and I wish there was more for them. Can you believe this is America? But given the conditions they force their employees to live in, it's hard to take seriously. The poverty in the Central Valley among farm workers is some of the worst in the country, and it has been historically. Ironically, the town Sean Hannity is filming in is infamous for this, immortalized in the 1997 documentary Cadillac Desert. The first uh, time that I went down to Westlands, Huron was uh, the, the largest community that had lost its doctor. It didn't have a high school. It didn't have a newspaper. Of course, everyone was living in very dilapidated rental housing. The, the actual conditions that we discovered that people were living under there uh, were as bad or worse than the uh, worst conditions that I've encountered in uh, Africa, south of the Sahara or southern India or any parts of uh, Latin America. A Spanish surname population uh, families were running 30% below the poverty level, <clears throat> which is particularly striking in the context of zero unemployment. The, uh, the, we couldn't find any evidence for unemployment in the region, so that people were, these were people working very hard uh, for be, uh, below poverty wages. And in some ways it's gotten worse. Because the valley is a bowl, all the air pollution from the motorized farm equipment and cars zipping down the I-5 just sits there like a fog. A child raised in the valley is 20% more likely to develop asthma. And that air pollution is only getting worse courtesy of the bigger and bigger forest fires breaking out in the surrounding mountains. And because of the deeper and deeper well drilling by farmers, the homes in the valley often can't get clean water from wells when there's a drought. We have had um, almost uh, almost two months with no water. The way we discovered our water well went dry was I went to use the restroom and when I flushed the toilet, nothing but dirt came out. I don't know what's in the water, but it's ain't good. If you drink the water, you end up having kidney problems and uh, stomach problems. In fact, while the entire nation was fixated on the Flint water crisis, the workers in the San Joaquin Valley were facing year two of having no clean water available to their house. And the farmers and their lobbyists seem mostly unconcerned about this. You know, you can do a documentary and you can go out and you can say, these people have a rough life, they don't, they have a low income, uh, but you can also live with them and work with them and know that they're happy people. It's just like if you go to the third world, the poorest people in the world, if they are adjusted and have a way of life, that is a fine way of life for them. Mexican-Americans, 
and found great work and, and, and like the, uh, in some cases, very well paying. In other cases, pretty marginal, but there's a way of life for them too. Driving a tractor is driving a tractor and it's outside. It's a better job than a lot of us have. Charming. But not exactly the vein you would want to take if you later want to hide behind your workers to demand a bigger bailout from the government. None of this, however, deterred the rest of the media from following suit. Westlands had hired one of the country's most powerful PR firms to kill the smell, and they got to work. CBS, The Wall Street Journal, The National Review, The Los Angeles Times, The Sacramento Bee, The San Francisco Chronicle. But my favorite is in Ben Shapiro's 2014 thriller novel, True Allegiance, where it is specifically the Delta smelt protections that spur Ben's Bundy militia-style terrorist hero, Soledad Ramirez, to heroically bomb the EPA and try to murder the president. The Environmental Protection Agency had ruled, and Congress hadn't overruled them, that the smelt fish were threatened by water overuse from the river. It didn't matter, according to the government, that her husband's father had bought the farm, worked it up from nothing. It didn't matter that she had 50-some employees and their families depended on her. All that mattered was the smelt. That damn fish. That night, she emptied her last bank account, some $25,000, then she went shopping. She had plenty of fertilizer, could obtain Tovex easily, and had her boys order nitromethane, supposedly so that they could race their hot rods around the area. She knew she was doing something borderline insane. Even though she'd taken all the precautions, no precautions could prevent the federal government from bringing all of its resources to bear. And if they were concerned enough about a fish to stifle the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of people, what would they do if someone destroyed one of their offices? The handoff went down in the middle of a Saturday night in an open field. She woke up with the television blaring. Pictures of the blown outside of the Water Resources Control Board offices on I Street in Sacramento led every news network. All of them. Even Soledad was somewhat shocked by the security video. It looked like something out of a Schwarzenegger movie, with cement and steel blasting into the night sky. Flumes of smoke and ash rose from the bombing site. The news crawl scrolled. Massive bombing at Federal Building. Terror suspected. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. But in the short term, the media blitz wasn't a great idea. Namely because it polarized an issue that was already moving in Westland's direction. Their senator, Dianne Feinstein, was already trying to craft legislation that would have given them 90% of what they wanted. And now in one Fox News segment, they had almost blown it up. Because every wingnut congressman was now submitting bills the next day to repeal the Endangered Species Act entirely, jamming up all the committee meetings. In, a, in essence... South Carolina is telling California how to handle its water issues. And Feinstein took it as a personal betrayal, even threatening a Westlands executive in the hallways of Congress. It also sandbagged the state's plans to help by building more dams, because now all the liberals south of the valley were primed to punish the wingnut farmers, and all the conservatives were now convinced that the state didn't need more water. It was just being wasted. So why should they pay more taxes for infrastructure? The almond farmers are using more water than all the people in L.A. and San Francisco combined. Half the almonds are shipping to China. And this is why we're getting water meters and we're getting lectured and scolded and we got to take shorter showers and we can't water our law. This is B.S. There isn't, even with the drought, really a water shortage problem. It's more a where the water is going problem. California agriculture accounts for 80% of our water use, even though California agriculture is less than 2% of our economy. But the biggest own goal would play out over the next 10 years. You see, the real battle lines between the fishermen and the farmers in the Delta wasn't the export restrictions. It was the plans to construct a new conveyance system, a massive $25 billion tunnel starting at the Sacramento River up north before it hits the Delta, then going all the way 40 miles underneath the entire Delta system to connect directly to the pumping plant in the south. This project has now gone through multiple names and iterations. The Peripheral Canal, the BDCP, California Water Fix, all basically refer to the same plan. If run correctly, the tunnel could allow the pumps to be turned off, meaning you could simultaneously protect the fish while making water deliveries more reliable. But the farmers in the Delta and the environmentalists don't trust the state to run the tunnel correctly. They think it's just going to take even more water out of the system. And like I said, it's $25 billion. And Westlands, being the stakeholder with the most to lose, was being asked to pay $3 billion. This PR blitz, I suspect, was more about trying to buffalo Obama into paying more money into the project than it was about the smelt. And turning the water into a culture war issue may have given Westlands powerful friends in the conservative movement but it cost them even more powerful allies, the Senate, Sacramento, the White House, and the voters of Southern California, whose bailout money they were going to need. So Westlands' leadership tried to walk it back. 
But it was too late. The conservative media had sunk its teeth into it, and they were not about to let go. It was too useful. It played up every stereotype about California they had pushed for years. And it could act as a scapegoat for anything bad happening in California involving water. Particularly, anything that could be interpreted as evidence of global warming. And in the following years, evidence of global warming would not be in short supply. For more than a century, surveyors have been taking core samples and measuring the water content of the snowpack using a hollow pole and a scale. 79 inches. 79 inches. The combined snowpack measurements from the past three years show a trend significantly below historic average. And as spring turns to summer, the changes may become even more dramatic. A recent NASA study found that as the Earth warms, the number of lightning strikes in the West will increase. Couple that with a U.S. Geological Survey study confirming trees across the West are dying at twice the historic rate due to rising temperatures and drought. And this is an example of a catastrophic fire where there won't be anything left from this fire. You'll end up with bare ground. This is, to some extent, the future. Most certainly is, given the, the trends that we're seeing now. California desperately needs rain. The drought that began in 2011 has grown worse every year since. We've got good years and bad years. This is, I call it, worse years. This is really bad. But we're facing a serious drought, obviously. Hopefully it'll rain, but who knows? And this isn't just the worst drought in 100 years, which has been talked about over and over and over again. A new study said this is the worst drought in 1,200 years. I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reduction across our state. The ground is literally sinking by up to one foot a year. The storm packing winds of up to 80 miles per hour began early Friday. Water rushing from the mountains triggered mudslide. The drenching rains were too much for the roads to handle. This 20 foot sinkhole swallowed two cars. Now the integrity of a major dam in California comes under threat. State water officials ordered the immediate evacuation of 188,000 people. Nearly 7,000 structures destroyed. The town of Paradise is basically ash. Up north, the death toll is still rising from the campfire, which has now claimed at least 48 lives. A frightening milestone, the Mendocino complex fire in the northern part of that state is now the largest wildfire in state history. The fire tornado exploded in the middle of what was already a gigantic, devastating wildfire. In California, the August complex fire has become the largest largest fire in state history. Nearly a half million acres have burned. This was originally about 30 different lightning started fires. Three fires burning north, east and south of San Francisco. The skyline of San Francisco looking more like an image from Mars. The orange glow from wildfires burning miles away, shrouding the city's landmarks, the smoke blocking out the sun. This temptation to minimize, to dismiss, is something that psychiatrists know very well about. They have a technical name for it. It's called denial. Denial. The rock group Dire Straits, I, I'm sure many of you know their repertoire, has, uh, has a line in one of their songs which goes, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Global warming doesn't necessarily mean less precipitation in the West, but it does mean it will come in more dramatic extremes, and more of that precipitation is going to come in the form of rain rather than snow, which means the water is going to start coming all at once in February, and then none at all for the rest of the year, with the exception of once every 7 to 10 years in which it just won't rain at all. That makes the same amount of water harder to store, which means less water on the off-season. The West problem isn't desertification, but an annual cycle of flood, drought, and fire, mixed with a decade-long cycle of mega-floods, mega-droughts, and mega-fires. And that means lots of terrifying images of very clear manifestations of climate change live on TV every year for the rest of our lives. And that means climate deniers are going to need a very good scapegoat if they're going to stop people from thinking, oh no, maybe Al Gore was right. So. You can imagine how important that little fish became. That Delta smelt 
You know, yeah. that little fish, that what was a mid, inch and a half fish, is driving farmers out of business. They, they take the side of the smelt over jobs, over farmers, over humanity. And they, why do we have to care about the Delta smelt, but we can't care about unborn human babies? What we have today is a man-made drought brought on by laws passed by Congress to where we're taking the breadbasket of the world and starving it of water to save little fish. He poisoned our water supply, burned our crops, and delivered a plague unto our houses! He, he did? did? No! But are we just gonna wait around until he does? And it has stuck. Read the comments on any news story about one of these disasters and you'll see people blaming the smelt. Local government officials yell at children about it. Investigated. No, the oh, answer to the question is your leftist buddies up there in Northern California won't let them run the pumps. And as the natural disasters escalated, so too did the conspiracy theories that they were man-made. It started with Devin Nunez alleging that San Francisco is just trying to destroy his constituents for absolutely no reason. Because for 40 years in this body, people have made a career of using water as a weapon. Why? Because they never liked the fact that farmers and farm workers were making what was once a dry area of the state the Garden of Eden of this world. Then when the drought was at its worst, Alex Jones started saying it was the result of chemtrails. We know there's geoengineering going on in California, that's admitted. It's going on all over the country, but really in California, one of the most intensive areas, and we've interviewed a lot of uh, meteorologists and others that say they believe the weather patterns What's happening to precipitation is unnatural, uh, so they're trying to call it a conspiracy theory. It's not. And of course, when the mega fires hit, that's when one congresswoman started blaming Rothschild space lasers. On a now deleted Facebook post, Green questioned whether California's deadly campfire in 2018 was started by lasers. Lasers, she says, somehow connected to the Rothschilds. And that is how, in the face of a massive drought, an American politician found himself machine gunning an endangered species as a solution. These Delta smelt just won't die. 8,000 years of human civilization, and here we are, still trying to bring the rain back with animal sacrifice. Back in the real world, the protections for the smelt had already been curtailed. Now that the drought was real, Obama wasn't going to take the political heat for a fish. So, the smelt's death warrant was signed, and it disappeared from the Delta. All the, the basic surveys that involve uh, sampling for smelt are catching virtually no smelt. Or and if the only effect of this successful propaganda drive was that a bunch of people who already didn't believe in global warming continue not believing in global warming, it wouldn't matter. But the thing about California's predicament is that it's not as bad as it looks. A more uneven distribution of water is a much better problem to have than a total net decrease in water supplies. And water is still very, very abundant. We're running out of it because we're wasting so much of it. Even a 25% reduction in consumption would essentially be a shift from very wasteful use to somewhat wasteful use. And of course, the key piece of infrastructure that could capture massive amounts of floodwaters and save it for super droughts is already on the table, the peripheral canal. But the canal is now further away from being built than it's ever been. And it was Westlands that blew up the deal. The state's largest irrigation district dealt a blow to the project by voting against the tunnels. The Westlands Water District isn't prepared to spend $3 billion on a plan that it calls too expensive for its farmers. If they couldn't get the infrastructure for free, they were just going to wait until a Republican became president and killed all the fish for them. Thanks to Fox News, that was their best hope. Westlands doesn't want to kill the Sacramento River Salmon Run because it's the only way to get their water. They want to kill the salmon because it's the cheapest way to get their water. The infrastructure to save and conserve water will cost money, and cutting water consumption means convincing individuals to voluntarily cut their water use. But if half of California thinks there's a bunch of water being wasted on a fish, they're not going to agree to more taxes and spending cuts to build the infrastructure, and they're not going to reduce their own consumption to relieve pressure on the system. And remember, the main beneficiary of these projects would be the farmers who started the myth. And you might ask, hold on. How much political power do idiots who believe everything they see on Fox News actually have? Aren't you exaggerating? To which I would respond, remember our 45th president? It is my high honor and distinct privilege 
to introduce to you the president-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the first major Republican politician to be a genuine consumer of the new right-wing misinformation, rather than just someone who cynically uses it to their advantage. He's a human, multi-level marketing scheme, if you will. So, when it came to the smelt myth, he was a true believer. But the mega drought ended just as he became president. He didn't need to do anything to turn Westland's water back on. Still, he needed to virtue signal what side he was on. So he made Westland's top lobbyist, David Bernhardt, Deputy Secretary of the Interior. And then later, just Secretary of the Interior. Now, putting lobbyists for a given industry in charge of the agency that regulates said industry is an old Republican tradition going back 40 years. But letting a lawyer hand out freebies to his own clients from the heights of the federal government is just a little too brazen, even for 2018 standards. So the administration announced he wouldn't touch any issue relating to his clients, including Westlands, for at least a period of two years. It was a promise he broke almost immediately. The Interior Department's internal watchdog is investigating ethics complaints against newly confirmed Secretary David Bernhard. Under his leadership, scientific studies that said pumping hurt fish were suppressed and scientists who didn't play ball were purged from the EPA. He didn't even wait two years before getting personally involved in the smelt issue, and he held secret meetings with Westlands before the first year was up. And in 2020, to no one's shock, the federal government gave Westlands a sweetheart deal in a legal settlement. It's hard to know if the smelt could have come back from the drought, but it never got the chance. With the pumping restrictions lifted, whatever fish were left were done for, and Westlands' lobbyists moved swiftly from promising the pumps wouldn't kill the fish to saying, they had already killed the fish anyway, you might as well let them pump. Trump also cut off all federal funding for the peripheral canal, though that was probably more to spite Jerry Brown than to help Westlands. You would think this would all be good news for Westlands, and on some level it was, but with that sweetheart deal came more attention and more scrutiny from the press. The best lobbyists and PR firms in the country do not come cheap, so Westlands had to make up the difference by cooking the books to make it look like they were hemorrhaging less money than they actually were. But lobbying wasn't the only thing they were spending money on. While they were pleading poverty, the district's executives had also awarded themselves a pretty generous compensation. One executive, for instance, getting a million and a half dollar interest-free home loan. Now I should note, this is, for some insane reason, not actually a crime. You're allowed to give unsecuritized home loans to employees for some... Wait, hold on. Jason Peltier. Where have I heard that name before? Wait, you? You can do a documentary and you can go out and you can say these people have a rough life, they don't, they have a low income, uh, but you can also live with them and work with them and know that they're happy people. Oh yeah, I mean, these Mexicans, they love working for $8 a day, but not me. I need a million dollar house, please. But who cares about scandals? At least Westland's got its water, right? Well, no. Westland's is still only slated to get between 0 and 5% of their allocation this year. Because that sweetheart deal didn't actually move them up the line to get water, it just made their hypothetical water cheaper. Which is useful if it actually snows, but uh... The snowpack in the Sierra has vanished. Instead of feeding into rivers and flowing into reservoirs, it melted into the ground. Research shows two years of drought left the ground so dry, the water just sank into the soil and never ran off. But wait, we're still not at the worst of it. Remember how I said those farmers mostly grow almonds and those almonds mostly go to Asia? Retaliatory tariffs from China on U.S. exports are now in place. The Chinese government making that announcement today saying it would increase tariffs by up to 25% on nearly 130 U.S. products. Tariffs on about $3 billion worth of U.S. imports, including frozen pork, certain fruits and nuts, including California's almonds and wine. One tweet can take away decades of relationship building in building markets, right? It wasn't just China either. India too. Millions of dollars in lobbying, all the billboards, all the media campaigns, all the dead fish, and the farmers are still at square zero, with significantly less time on the clock, and their market share decimated. But they were desperate. And in their desperation, they turned to men they didn't entirely understand. And that plan worked about as well as any that hinges on the reliability of a zombie-eyed psychopath. I got hit with a strap, bam, bam, bam. I, I, and I've never been to a shrink uh, by my father. I would tell you that I deserved it. I think he- The smell wasn't completely useless, by the way. When it was abundant, it acted as a buffer. 
As long as there were lots of smelt to go around, predators could get busy eating them instead of eating the more valuable baby salmon. But the salmon, it turns out, is not the only potential prey protected by the smelt. There is only so much longer an extinct fish can take the blame for global warming. A new scapegoat is going to be needed, and it appears the conservative media has already chosen one. The people of California. Failed liberal policies are just simply encouraging the situation. People just saying we can't put up with this anymore. So you just can't live like this. The conservative media has now settled on trying to prove that California is actually just destroying itself because of liberal ideology. The wildfires aren't caused by global warming. They're caused by green energy. The green energy mandate turned the power company's attention and resources away from the power grid and to wind and solar. In 2018, fully half of California's wildfires were started by power lines or related electrical problems. It's not hard to figure out why. California's power grid is ancient. It's not that the power company didn't know there was a problem. They knew, but they were focused on more pressing political priorities, like green energy. That's where PG&E, a public utility, which just means it's the politicians who call the shots, put its money and resources. So believe it or not, Fred Flintstone here is lying too. PG&E is a private company and has been starting fires in California for decades. And also it took like 30 seconds of looking through this video sources to see a complete contradiction. For another example, see the constant banging on about homelessness as being caused by an unwillingness to use the correct amount of police brutality on homeless people rather than, you know, studio apartments being $3,000 a month. What do we do about the homeless? If you live in a big city, especially on the West Coast, you literally face it every day. The word itself is misleading. Homelessness is not primarily a housing problem, it's a human problem. But this dramatically understates the biggest draw of all, the de facto legalization of street camping, drug consumption, and property crime. Now, you might remember this guy as the guy who started the panic over critical race. Wait, hold on. Did he just say stealing is legal in California? Where California progressives push for more drug injection sites and have decriminalized thefts under $950. Is this the thing? Oh my God, it is. We get so focused on the really crazy shit like QAnon, we totally miss out on all the mundane crazy shit they believe, like California legalized stealing. Oh, and apparently they're spreading the plague now? Bubonic plague likely already present in Los Angeles, according to Dr. Drew. Why is this happening? California has a democratic supermajority, you'd think, they could get on, you know, on, on one track to solve these problems. And there are two reasons I'm telling you this story. Reason one, it is a perfect illustration of the Frankenstein-Frankenstein's monster relationship between corporate interests and right-wing media. Some C-suite asshole decides to lash out at a government regulation that annoys him. He hires some amoral PR firm to put pressure on politicians. They turn to right-wing media, where the story starts out as a micro-targeted campaign against a specific policy, but is soon exaggerated into a crisis. A crisis which catches on with viewers to become a moral panic. A moral panic that metastasizes into an apocalyptic mass hysteria, destroying everything in its path and, more often than not, leaving the capitalists that started it worse off in the long run. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. And then there's reason two. If right-wing media's plans for dealing with climate-related disasters is no longer to deny links to climate change, but to instead try and convince their viewers that the victims of these disasters just sort of have it coming, that doesn't just convince people not to do anything to prevent climate change. It has the nasty side effect of convincing people not to prepare for the consequences of not doing anything about climate change and to refuse help to any victims of it. And that's a problem because California is not going to be alone in having a water and fire crisis. Across Texas, towns like Robert Lee experienced record-breaking temperatures last year. Already dry grass and brush turned into perfect kindling for the worst wildfire season in Texas history. Five wildfires are burning in Utah, and the governor has declared a drought emergency there. The Great Salt Lake is expected to reach its lowest point in modern history. Pictures and stories continue to file out from Australia about the devastating fires. You can see all the areas that they're dealing with wildfires. Cape Town, South Africa could become the world's first major city to run out of water. 
what they're calling day zero, maybe less than three months away. Security forces in Iran's Khuzestan province have been firing bullets at people protesting over a severe lack of water. 600 million Indians, that's nearly half the population, are facing acute water shortages. What can be one of the coldest places on earth is on fire. Firefighters, no match for flames this ferocious and this intense. The death toll from wildfires in Turkey has increased to eight. Malnourished children and adults are forced to forage for leaves Farmers to have eat. had to resort to using cardboard as food for their horses. A record-setting heat wave has fueled the fires. Fires are forcing thousands of people to evacuate. Flames are tearing through the Greek... I am stunned by how horrible the heat. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like the video, and I will see you again soon. And a huge thank you to my very patient patrons. Kitten of the Yarn Persuasion, Diana Banana, Big Nove, Fahig Kitten, Tedsville, Knowing Better, Ryan Refner, Zach Christensen, Scott Beckett, Gabo Tsai, Joel Gomez, Carl Nyo, Armin Humeberg, Rob Field, and Ari and I.